This is part 18 of ASP.NET Web API tutorial. In this video, we'll discuss implementing basic authentication in ASP.NET Web API. So here is what we want to do. We're going to have these two tables, users and employees. If I log in with mail username, then we want to authenticate that user and authorize him to retrieve only mail employees from this employees table. Similarly, if we log in with female username, then we want to authenticate and authorize him to retrieve only the female employees. So the first step here is to create users table. We already have the employees table. So let's flip to SQL Server Management Studio. Here is the SQL script to create and populate users table with test data. I'll have the script available on my blog in case you need it. I've already executed the script. So here we have both the tables with test data. The next step is to update our ADO.NET Entity Data Model. So let's flip to Visual Studio. The ADO.NET Entity Data Model is present in Employee Data Access Project. So let's double click on this Employee Data Model. At the moment, we only have the Employees table here. So let's right click on the designer surface here and select Update Model from Database. So this is going to show us the Users table. So let's select the Users table and then click finish. So this should add users table to our ADO.NET entity data model. The next thing that we want to do is create a custom class that's going to check if the provided username and password are valid. So let's right click on our employee service project, add, and we want to add a class file. Let's name this class file employee security. Within this employee security class, we are going to have a public method which is going to be static and this method is going to return boolean. Let's name this method login. This method is going to have two parameters, both of them of type string. The first parameter is username and the second parameter is password. Now within this class, we are going to make use of the entities that we have in our employee data access project. So let's bring in employee data access namespace. So within our login method, let's create an instance of employee DB entities class. Let's call the instance entities equals new employee DB entities. So here we are going to write a link statement which is going to return true or false. It returns true if we have a matching username and password in the database table. Otherwise, it's going to return false. So return we have the entities instance dot users dot any user such that user dot username dot equals. So we are going to compare the username with the provided username. And we want this comparison to be case insensitive. So string comparison dot ordinal ignore case. So when we compare the username, we are least worried about the case sensitivity. And we also need to verify if the password match. So user dot password equals the provided password. So if both the username and password matches, then this link statement is going to return true. Otherwise, it's going to return false. Basic authentication is implemented as a filter. So we're going to create our own custom attribute. So let's right click on our employee service project, add, and we want to add a class file. Let's name this class file basic authentication attribute. And this class is going to inherit from authorization filter attribute class. And this class is present in a different namespace. Let's bring that namespace in, system.web.http.filters. And we're going to override a method that's present in this base class. And that method is on authorization. And notice this method has a parameter action context. This parameter provides us access to both the request and response object. Now, with basic authentication, the client sends the credentials using a header. So the request object has got headers, and we check for authorization header. So let's use this action context parameter. We are going to use the request property to get to the request object, and we are going to check for headers. 
and the header that we are looking for is authorization header. If it is null, then that means the client has not sent the credentials. In that case, we want to send unauthorized response. So let's go ahead and create a response. So action context dot response equals, we're going to use the action context again, dot request dot create response. This method is present in a different namespace. So let's go ahead and bring in that namespace, system.net.http. And we want to return unauthorized status code. So HTTP status code, and this HTTP status code class is present in a different namespace and that is system.net.http so let's bring in that namespace and we want to return unauthorized so if the header is not present then we know the basic credentials are missing in that case we return unauthorized else if the header is there then we want to retrieve the username and password right so let's create a variable of type string and I'm going to call this authentication token equals again we're going to use the action context um, object dot request dot headers and we're going to look in the authorization header and we use the parameter property to get the authentication token Okay, so here the authentication token will be base64 encoded. So basically, you know, we are looking for a username and password, and the way they will be sent is username and password will be separated by a colon like this. And then this won't be a regular string, it will be base64 encoded string that will be passed to the server from the client. So whatever we have in this authentication token is going to be base64 encoded and it will be in this format username colon password so we need to do two things in order to get to the username and password first we need to base64 decode that and then split it using this colon and then retrieve the username and password so first let's base64 decode it to decode it from base64 we are going to use the convert class dot from base64 string and to this one we are going to pass our authentication token so once it is decoded we need to retrieve that string and to retrieve that string we are going to use the encoding class which again is present in a different namespace system.txt so let's bring in that namespace dot utf8 dot get string so this is basically going to return the decoded string. And let's store that in a variable of type string. Let's call this decoded authentication token. OK, so in this variable, we have the decoded authentication token. But again, we still have the username and password in this format so we need to split that using this colon so the next thing that we are going to do is on this decoded authentication token let's use the split method and we are going to split using the colon symbol and what is the split method going to do it's going to return a string array basically in that array we are going to have two strings the first string contains the username and the second string contains the password so let's store it in a variable of type string array let's call this username password array so this username password array contains our username and password now let's create a variable let's call it username equals username password array of zero so that's going to give us the username and similarly to get to the password we use username password array of one so now we have our username and password
Now we need to do one more thing. We need to set the current principal of the executing thread to this username. So we know, you know, the username that we are using to execute the code. So if now remember we have created a custom class employee security which is going to check within the database if the provided username and password match so we are going to make use of this class here so if employee security dot login and to this we are going to pass username and password So if the method returns true, what does that mean? We have the username and password in the database. And in that case, we want to set. So this thread class is present in a different namespace, system.threading. Let's bring that in. So we want to set the current principal of the thread to new generic principal. And again, this generic principal class is present in a different namespace. So let's bring that namespace in. That is system.security.principal. And we are going to create a generic identity here. So let's create an instance of generic identity class. And to this, we are going to pass the username. So, And it also requires rules. For now, let's set rules to null. So basically here, we are creating a generic identity and a generic principle and setting that as the current principle for the thread. So if we have a matching username and password, this is what we are doing. Else, what do we want to do? If, if the username and password doesn't match, then we want to return unauthorized response. So let's do the same thing here. So we have you know, our basic authentication attribute. Now we have set the current principle of the thread to the identity of the user. So now let's modify the get method within our employees controller to return, you know, only male employees if we are logged in with male username and only female employees if we are logged in with female username. Within our employees controller, let's make use of the authenticated username. So within our employees controller, we have our get method here. So within this get method, I am going to create a variable of type string. Let's call this username equals thread. The thread class is present in system.threading. Let's bring that namespace in dot current principle dot identity dot name. Now, remember, within our basic authentication attribute, we are setting the current principle of the executing thread to the authenticated username. So we are retrieving that authenticated username right here. And we know this username is going to be male or female. Now, if the username is male, then we want to retrieve only male employees. And if it's female, then we want to retrieve only female employees. So the authorization, we're going to do it here. So we are going to switch on the username. So if the username is male, then we want to return only male employees. If it is female, then we want to return only female employees. If it is default, that is if it's not male or female, then we simply want to return a bad request. We don't want any message. So let's get rid of this message from here. So if it's not male or female, we are simply going to return a bad request. So here we have modified the get method within our employees controller to return only male employees if we are logged in with male username. And it's going to return only female employees if we are logged in with female username. To keep things simple, let's remove this require HTTPS attribute from the get method. Now, the basic authentication attribute that we have just created, this can be applied on a specific controller, specific action, or globally on all web API controllers. To enable basic authentication across the entire web API application, register this basic authentication attribute as a filter using the register method in our web API 
config class. So just like how we have registered the require HTTPS attribute, in a similar way, we can register the basic authentication attribute as a filter, which is going to enable basic authentication across our entire web API application. We can also apply the attribute on a specific controller. For example, if we apply it on the employee's controller, like how we have applied the enable cars attribute, then it is going to uh, be applicable for all methods within our employee's controller. In our case, let's just enable basic authentication for this get method. So let's decorate this with our basic authentication attribute. Let's save our changes and give our solution a build. Let's test basic authentication using Fiddler. Notice here we are issuing a request to slash API slash employees. This calls get method within our employees controller. Notice this get method is decorated with basic authentication attribute. But with the request that we have issued using Fiddler, we have not specified any credentials. So when we execute this, notice we get status code 401 unauthorized. So we need to specify the credentials as well. So if you look at this basic authentication attribute that we have created, we are using authorization header to retrieve the username and password. So with the request that we have issued in Fiddler, we are going to use authorization header to specify username and password. We are using basic authentication, so we need to specify the string basic and then followed by that username password string. And remember, username and password should be in this format, username colon password. We have a username female and the password for that is female. But we cannot specify the colon separated username and password in this format. We will have to base64 encode this. There are many websites that help us do that. If you just Google with this string base64 encode, the first website that you'll get is this one, base64encode.org. And in this website, you can paste your username password string in this text box. And then when you click this button, we get the base64 encoded string. So let's copy it and specify it in Fiddler. Now let's execute this. Now notice we get status code 200 OK. And if you look at the JSON data that we got, notice we only got female employees because we have used female username. Now on the other hand, let's try and use male username. The password is also male. Let's click this encode button to get the encoded string. Let's copy this and specify it here. So when we execute this, we should only get male employees. So if we look at the JSON data, notice we only have male employees. Now what happens if we use an invalid username and password? Let's say ABC and ABC. We don't have such username and password. Let's encode that first. Copy it and specify it right here. So now when we execute this request, we should get unauthorized. So notice we get status code 401 unauthorized as expected. On this slide, we have employee security class code. And on this slide, we have basic authentication attribute class code. Now, if we navigate to localhost employees.html and when we click this get all employees button, notice we don't get the data that we expect. And if we inspect this request in Fiddler, we got 401 unauthorized. Now, if you look at that HTML page in Visual Studio, we are using jQuery Ajax to call the Web API service, but we are not passing the basic authentication credentials. And that's the reason why we are getting 401 unauthorized. In our next video, we'll discuss how to pass basic authentication credentials using jQuery Ajax. Thank you for listening and have a great day.